Yeah, How you doing, John? Good. Here he comes. Uh, yeah. He's coming. I, I, I can preach without my jacket. Not sunny. <laughs> my sister. No. Did she want it? She's going to. I mean, I think we can. I have mine. Too. Well, good morning. Happy summer to you all. <laughs> it is so great to be back. I was gone last week, and I want to thank Joel from Front Porch Ministries who came in and preached, told us a little bit more about the ministry that we support, and uh, bringing the message last week. Ann and I were visiting family in Newport Beach, and it was a heat wave with all kinds of uh, humidity coming up from Mexico, and this is the honest truth. Every day I looked at the temperature here in Cambria and thought, why did I go on vacation? <laughs> so it truly is good to be home, and I'm glad to be with you today. We're going to worship today, and we are so grateful. This is the day the Lord has made, and we're to rejoice and be glad in it. So I invite you to listen as we prepare our hearts for the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Would you pray with me? 
Yeah, it doesn't matter whether we're outside in the mist or inside in our beautiful sanctuary. We are here to be in your presence, to worship you, to lift up your name, to sing your praises. And we're grateful for this community that you have together. You have called us to be your people, to share your good news of joy and peace and salvation through Jesus Christ. But you've also called us together to be a family, to nurture one another and to encourage one another. We are so grateful for one another because that is what makes church so unique. We're not just an organization or some group, but we are a family, the family of God that you have called together. And as part of the family, we lift up our prayers and our concerns for those who are in the family and also in our community. Lord, I want to thank you especially and give you praise for Don Camper, who is continuing to heal from his surgery. We pray that you would continue to heal his body. I pray that the medicines would work and that he would be up and around. And we are so grateful for the ministry that Don does with our deacons. And we pray for a quick and further recovery. Lord, we pray for Janet Brisbane, who is going to have oral surgery on Tuesday. Pray that that would go smoothly, that she can be back and speaking and looking forward to the children's messages that she tapes and we send out to our youth. We praise you too, Lord, for Kathy Rippey's granddaughter, Casey. The prayers are being answered and Casey is doing better. And Lord, we thank you for Gene Wagner's successful surgery on his eyes this week. Uh, he described what he has to do for recovery and it seems worse than the surgery. But we pray, Lord, for healing for him, that you would give him patience and I just thank you for the ministry that he continues to do in serving your church. Lord, I know there's many other things that have gone unspoken. You know what they are. We lift them all up to you. You are the one who hears us, and with compassion, you answer. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but always with our best in mind. For you are our creator. You know us intimately, and you love us. And that is why you sent Jesus to die for our sins, that we might be the children of God. Lord, for all of this, we are so grateful and we worship your name today. And is it in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
before we start, I do want to thank Martha and Gary. They, I told them I was going on vacation, and Martha said, we'll take care of it. I'll call a few friends. And I want to thank Deborah for being here, and Sandy, who came back to play, and Steve and Tommy for singing. Um, great things happen when I'm gone. So it's, <laughs> it's I'll be leaving in tomorrow. Yeah. Hey, would you pray with me before you go step into God's Word this morning? God, I love your Word. Every time I open the Bible, I, I learn something new. I learn how much you love me. I learn my shortcomings, but I learn how you've overcome all of that through Jesus. I pray now that you give me the words to say that together we might learn from this difficult passage in Ezra, that you would give us understanding and compassion and the realization that we sometimes could be just like these people. God, we're here to serve you, to build your kingdom and experience joy in your love. And I pray that through the hearing of your word today, we might do all of that. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was in college, I was part of my church uh, college group. And one of the things that my pastor said all the time was, if you have non-Christian friends, bring them to college group, bring them to church. And I had one friend in particular who took that to a whole new level. He purposely went out and found in his I don't know how to say this. Just the cutest girls he could find. Didn't matter if they were Christian or not. And he would date them with the whole intention of bringing them to church after they got to know each other pretty well. My friends and I call this missionary dating, and my friend was really good about it. So I'm telling you that to help you understand where we're going in this very difficult passage in Ezra this morning. Uh, my my friend started dating a church a girl who had never been to church before, and she was pretty hesitant to come. I had known her from another uh, situation, but she was hesitant because she didn't know what to expect. She'd never been to church before. Uh, she'd heard all kinds of stories. Her idea of church was what she saw on TV. And our college pastor welcomed her in. His fiance invited her to join her Bible study and she just loved it. What we didn't know is that she was in a very difficult place in her life and this is exactly what she needed. She heard about God's love and she was surrounded by people that really cared for her and wanted to encourage her. None of us knew this was a difficult time for her, but God did. She ended up giving her life to Jesus and became very involved in our church, more so than her boyfriend. As she and my friend eventually broke up and she poured her free time into the church and my friend started his process all over again and started dating a non-Christian girl. Only this time, his new girlfriend didn't want to go to church. My friend started missing church. We had a, a Bible study with eight great guys, and he just kind of fell away from that. Sundays became the time that he hung out with his girlfriend. He would tell me that his girlfriend wasn't ready for church just yet, but he was working on it. It didn't take very long until my friend stopped going to church altogether. He didn't leave his girlfriend to Christ. She led him away. Now, remember this story. Because I hope it'll help you understand what, what we're about to read. Because we're ending our study in Ezra now with a, a very difficult and actually even a disturbing passage this morning. It's, it's one that I wish I could have skipped. I mean, we could have just stopped a couple weeks ago, ended on a big high. Hey, everybody knows God. Um, but that's not being faithful to the text. So we're going to end our study in Ezra with this passage. And let's jump in and just figure it out. This is Ezra 10, 1 through 7. While Ezra prayed and made his confession, weeping and lying face down on the ground in front of the temple of God, a very large, large crowd of people from Israel, men and women and children, gathered and wept bitterly with him. Then Shechaniah, son of Juhil, a descendant of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God, for we have married these pagan women of the land. But in spite of all of this, there is hope for Israel. Let us now make a covenant with our God to divorce our pagan wives and send them away with their children. We will follow the advice given by you and all the others who we respect and also respect the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law of God. Get up, for it is your duty to tell us how to proceed in these settings and put us straight. We are behind you, so be strong and take action. So Ezra stood up and demanded that the leaders of the priests and the Levites and all the people of Israel swear that they would do what Shachaniah had said. Then they all swore a solemn oath. 
Then Ezra left the front of the temple of God and went to the room where Jehonanan, son of Elisheba, had spent the night, and he went there without eating or drinking anything. He was still in mourning because of the unfaithfulness of the returned exiles. Then a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem that all exiles should come to Jerusalem. Those who failed to come within three days, if the leaders and elders so decided, forfeit all their property and would be expelled from the assembly of the exiles. Within three days, all the people of Israel and Judah, excuse me, Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem. This took place on December 19th, and all the people were sitting in the square before the temple of God. They were trembling both because of the seriousness of the matter and because it was raining. Then Ezra the priest stood and said to them, you have committed a terrible sin. By marrying pagan women, you have increased Israel's guilt. So now, confess your sin to the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do what he demands. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from these pagan women. Then the whole assembly raised their voices and answered, Yes, you are right. We must do as you say. This is one of those passages that is so contrary to what we know as Christians that I'm sure I've never heard a sermon preached on it before. But as we've been learning throughout Ezra and the messages in each of these chapters, we find that even this bizarre and difficult passage has an underlying message. And it's the heart of this message that I hope we can discover today. So here's the issue. Having returned to Jerusalem, the exiles were in danger of losing their relationship with God by assimilation through the culture around them. Now, when Ezra first arrived, 60 years um, after the first exiles had come to Jerusalem, he's appalled by the state of affairs. Several men had married local women, and this is the key point. They began to worship the gods of their wives. Even some of the priests and Levites who were responsible for the spiritual teaching of the exiles, they had done this too, and they knew better. So in response to what Ezra is looking around and seeing, he, in a very Jewish fashion, starts ripping out his hair and rips his clothes in repentance, and he prays out loud. The people see this, and they join him, because they're feeling convicted. One of the men, Shechaniah, suggests to Ezra that they make a new covenant with God and get rid of the foreign wives and children. And the people, wracked with guilt, think this is the way to go. Their decision really was a pendulum swing to the other side. But was it of God? Here's what we know. When the Israelites were, when the ancestors, I should say, of the Israelites were first given the land, God makes a covenant with his people, and he's very clear. I'll clear out the tribes that are there, but with conditions. In Deuteronomy 7.3, God tells them this. You must not intermarry with them, meaning the other tribes in the land. Do not let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters, for they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and he will quickly destroy you, for you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. See, the holiness of Israel was at stake here. And to be God's people meant they were supposed to be separate, set apart from all the other tribes that are around who were practicing things that God thought was detestable. It meant following God's laws and passing those laws on to their children and to their grandchildren to the next generation. The problem was, this wasn't happening. See, when a husband who married a foreign wife died, the land went to the survivors. And in Jewish law and the law around, that law, that land became foreign land. Even though it was bought by the Jewish family, it was tilled, it was, uh, houses were built on it. If one of these people who had married a foreign wife, if he died, his land, his stock, his cattle, his family, everything became foreign. It was no longer part of Israel. The other thing is uh, the men knew better. They knew that they should never have married these pagan wives who were unwilling to learn the ways of God. And that's the key for us this morning to help understand this passage. Several times God had sent their ancestors prophets to warn them not to take wives for themselves or their sons from the land, for those who were not part of the tribe. They were to have nothing to do with the pagan cultures that were surrounding them. 
Now, the returning exiles, they came back, but they blew it with God. So to fix what they had done, they decided to divorce themselves from the problem that they had created. And here's the thing. There were only 111 men who had done this out of about 30,000 exiles who returned. You continue reading on in verses 18 through 44 of chapter 10. It's just a list of names and the occupations of the people who had done this. Their disobedience could have a devastating effect on the nation, a nation that they were trying to rebuild in many ways from scratch. Assimilation into the culture is what happened to the 10 tribes of the north where they just ceased to exist. So that had to be a little bit on their mind. So they divorced their foreign wives and got rid of their children. And here's where we struggle with this as Christians. Uh, we know in the Bible both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God hates divorce. Jesus confirms this in Matthew 19 when some of the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? And this was happening. It was rampant in Jerusalem at the time. And Jesus answers, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it is not what God originally intended. See, in the New Testament, God allows for divorce in very specific circumstances. Adultery, abuse, or abandonment. Marrying a foreign wife was not one of these conditions. The Apostle Paul gives us further guidance. The church in Corinth was tearing itself apart because the believers were divorcing their unbelieving spouses. And this is what Paul writes to them. If a Christian man has a wife who is not a believer, and she's willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. And if a Christian woman has a husband who is not a believer, and he's willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. For the Christian wife brings holiness to her marriage, and the Christian husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy. But now they are holy. But if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the Christian husband or wife is no longer bound to the other. For God has called you to live in peace. Don't you wives realize that your husbands might be saved because of you? And don't your, you husbands realize that your wives might be saved because of you? This is 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 16. Nowhere does God's command that, does God command that people divorce their spouses. As Jesus says, the two shall become one flesh. And the biblical understanding is the divorce tears apart the very thing that God considers holy. So the question is raised in this chapter, did Ezra's men go too far and it, under his leadership by divorcing their foreign wives? I'll tell you, theologians are split on this particular passage. There really is no simple yes or no answer among theologians and people who've studied this and trying to understand what was going on. On the one hand, the history of Israel shows that there are many times that God's people fell away because of the influence of foreign uh, wives and, and foreign gods. And look at King Solomon. This was his downfall. But there's many examples of foreigners marrying into Jewish families and becoming significant in God's kingdom. Probably the greatest example I can think of is Ruth, who marries, uh, who was a Moabite, just a one of the tribes that was forbidden. She marries Boaz and becomes the great, great, great grandmother of King David and part of the line of direct ancestor of Jesus. So as modern Christians raised on Jesus' teaching, and Paul's urges to the church, when we read this passage in Ezra, we, we wish, at least I do, that they had at least offered an opportunity for the 111 uh, men to invite their wives into the fellowship, to give up their pagan gods and follow the one true God. If they'd done that, this would have been a far different story. They would have repented of their sins and taught their wives and children to follow God's love and we wouldn't have had the tragedy that appears here and also appears even in more harsh form than Nehemiah chapter 13, which is the follow-up to Ezra. But I understand why they took extreme measures. They were desperate to get right with God. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Maybe you've done something or neglected something and you just feel so distant from God and you would do anything to get back that, that joy of your salvation, as the scripture says even willing to compromise. They were in that spot. They had realized that they had gone so far away from God 
even though they had been sent back to the Holy Land to rebuild the worship and the, the community. And they were desperate to get right with God. They knew they had done wrong. The men who married these local wives uh, were being led into pagan worship. They had disobeyed God's command. And the rest of the nation was equally complicit because they allowed it to happen. Now they're willing to bargain with God in the form of a new covenant, thinking that's going to eliminate the sin that they had allowed to creep into their lives in the community. So here's the takeaway we get from this difficult story in Ezra. Bottom line is God desires our faithfulness. All of us get caught up in sins on a daily basis. Some are here right now struggling with sin in situations where there doesn't seem to be any solutions. But the good news for us is that we have a greater hope than even the exiles knew. We have God's promised deliverer, the one who is the new covenant. Let me read this passage to you from Hebrews 10. This is verses 11 and 12 and 19 and 22. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day and after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciousness, consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. This is the great news that we celebrate this morning, that we are forgiven by the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. But what we do when we continue to sin and maybe even ignore God's instruction for our lives? Well, I've found myself in this position before, and here's some practical advice that I found throughout Scripture that has helped me many times over, and I'm hoping it will help you this morning as well. I think of it like the three R's for overcoming the messes that we tend to make in our life when we ignore God. It's realize, repent, and reform. I struggle to find three R's. That way you could remember this, but let me unpack this a little bit for you. Realize, repent, and reform. It's actually what we've been talking about over the last three weeks. Realize is realizing that the sin that we are doing needs to stop. You see, sometimes when we get caught up in sin, we try to rationalize it or justify it. Or think of it as normal, maybe even celebrate it. I think we need to start by realizing when we sin. And here's where I often struggle. It's sometimes with the little sins. You know, the things that we almost don't even think of as sins. Like little white lies or little things that just get us one step a little further down that path of walking away from God completely. Maybe it's a little fib or a little misdirection. The thing is, little sins don't magically erase themselves. If we don't take notice of even the little things, we may be deceiving ourselves when the stakes are much higher, like the exiles have done with their foreign wives. As I look at the story in Ezra 10, I, I, I got to believe they did start out thinking, you know, today's a great day to ignore the Word of God. <sighs> There's some cute women over there. Let's go. You know, <laughs> nobody starts off like that. Well, maybe no one, but most people we know. Uh, I imagine it was innocent at first. Or maybe smiling at the beautiful women at the well or walking her home, inviting her to dinner. And like my friend in college, without realizing they've invested in someone who doesn't know or even care about God. They're in too deep. They see Ezra repenting on their behalf and suddenly they have this, oh no, what have I done kind of moment. I mean, they've been racked with guilt. And when they see Ezra the priest repenting, they realize they need to do the same thing. So do we. We need to realize when we've sinned, not justify it, not make excuses for it, but just stop right there. So, you know, this isn't right. I need to do something about it. When we as Christians do this, it allows us to step closer to what God has ideally for us. The problem is we are often like the people of the exiles. It still happens to us. We, we have a hard time discovering or even admitting when we're doing wrong in God's eyes. See, the, the people in the exiles, they were ignoring God's word. 
They were ignoring his teaching. They were just living the life that they knew. And we do this as Christians too. You know, how many times do we know that something's right and we not do it? Or that we treat scripture as a suggestion instead of an instruction book? So one of the things that the Bible makes us aware of is that there's a problem. This was Paul's whole argument about the law. He said as he went to the churches and the Jews were arguing against him about the Messiah, he said, look, the purpose of the law is to let you know that you're not right with God, that you need a way back. And when he pointed that way to Jesus, as God had set it up for the Messiah. But when we fall short, when we ignore Scripture, we need to do the same thing. We need to realize that we are sinning. And then the next step is to repent. Now that's a, a good old church word that basically means to ask for forgiveness. Instead of justifying our sins in our own minds, we confess them to God. You see, repenting is an act that takes humility and ownership. It's saying, I sinned. The great news, the really, really awesome news this morning is that God already knows this. He's there waiting to forgive you. The Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Think of it this way. Sin is like excess baggage that drags you down. It will destroy you. Get rid of it. Confess it. Let it go, and then make it change. And that's what reform means. And I think this is really where most of us struggle. It's daily living differently than we did before, especially before we knew God. It is daily seeking to imitate Jesus and how we love others and treat one another and conduct business. It's knowing that we can do whatever we want, but we choose to follow Jesus instead. And as we learn to reform our former ways, the decision to follow God's way becomes easier and easier. Realize, repent, and reform. When we make this our habit, we come to a place where we can once again rejoice. Fourth R didn't fit in my analogy, but there's four R's for you. Because that's really what we're doing here today. We are rejoicing. This would be like my former pastor used to say, a gathering of sinners anonymous. But we get to rejoice because we are former. Our sins are no longer held against us. And yes, we do continue to sin. We're not perfect. But Jesus has paid the price so that we don't have to live in that sin. We don't have to wallow in our guilt. We can say, oh yeah, I blew it. Lord, I'm sorry. And rejoice in knowing that we are forgiven. See, the hardest thing I've found when I counsel folks is often people get through those first two steps. Yeah, they know they've done something. They repent of it. But they can't just get to that point where they can be for, feel forgiven. They hold on to all that baggage. Like, you know, God's just not powerful enough to take this away. I was really bad. And that is so not what Scripture says. When Jesus died for your sins, he died for your sins completely. There is nothing else, but we have to accept that. And part of repentance is accepting that forgiveness. And friends, when you do that, that's when we really rejoice. Last week I read Psalm 51, which is David's very personal cry to God after this horrific sin he committed with Uriah uh, by putting him out on the battle line so he could be killed, and then David could have his wife Bathsheba. In the midst of this painful repentance, listen to what uh, this verse of hope from uh, verse 7. David writes, purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Give me back the joy of my salvation, and let me rejoice. Have you ever been in that place? Now listen to the actions David invites uh, God to do in his life so that he may live this restoration. As great as King David was, as revered as he is even to this day in Israel, he knew his limitations. He got to the point where he kept faith, quit faith in it. He just said, God, I need you. Please do this in my life. And here's what he asked. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a loyal spirit within me. 
Restore, restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. I don't know about you, but this is when I read this psalm and I start asking, what is it that I need to do? What is it that we need to do? What are we willing to do to get right with God? So what is it that God's word invites you to do? Is there something that you're doing now? Maybe it's a habit you've fallen into. Maybe it's like you want to put in a percentage or a pie graph, like 98% of your life is going so great, but there's that little 2% that still kind of drags you back down. Like Satan saying, see, you're not good enough. Come back. You belong to me. Jesus says, wait a minute. You belong to me. So what is it you're doing that we need to repent? Is there something that you're doing that's honoring God, that is in a positive way? If there is, continue to do that. I mean, as I've gotten to know this congregation, you all are great encouragers. You're wonderful players. I'm so grateful to serve here with people who want to know God's word. I mean, there's some things that we're doing as a church that we should continue doing. Another way of wondering if what you're doing is really what God's having you do is ask yourself, is it leading other people to Christ? Is your conversation spiced with love and generosity? I say that because this is an election year. <laughs> many, many years ago, I served in the Virginia State Legislature as an intern as part of my seminary training. And one of the things that really impressed me was I'd go out into the, the hall in, there in Richmond, and you have Democrats and Republicans, and they were just going out at it. The big issue of the day was riverboat gambling. You know, one, one was going to be the downfall of the, the country. The other was going to be the salvation of the, the Commonwealth. And these guys and women would go at it. But the chaplain would hold a Bible study once a week on Wednesdays, and I went to that as part of my uh, seminary training. And what a difference. These people who had been arguing with each other, that was a long time ago. You know, now... It's very different, and I just encourage you to be a Christian. This isn't a political story. But the answer to any of that is no. Let me encourage you to stop, to repent, to seek God's way. Let me leave you with this word. This is Hebrews 10, 26 to 27. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we receive the So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now, so that then you will receive all that he has promised. Let's put that into practice. Let me invite you to pray with me. That for as difficult as this passage is and so foreign to our ears, we can kind of understand that you desire that we live lives that are pure and in truth. You desire that our conversations show love and grace. We thank you for Jesus, who gives a very different ending to a situation like this. Or while we were still sinners and enemies of God, Jesus came that we might have life. Now that is the great news that comes from our salvation. That it doesn't matter how far away we were with you, or even as we came to you and maybe slid back into some things that we had been doing. There is nothing that we can do that will separate us from your love. So right now, today, this very moment, help us to realize maybe some habits we've fallen into. Maybe some conversations that aren't so helpful. Maybe our attitudes towards others or the way that we've been treating people where on one hand we're saying encouraging things and the other we're tearing down. Lord, forgive us for these sins. Forgive us for not being loving. Forgive us for not being encouraging. Forgive us for not pointing the way to Jesus and instead pointing to ourselves. And we want to be your people. We want to receive the blessings you want to pour down. Your song today. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of God.
service, we have our two boxes up here for your tithes and your gifts and your offerings that you're will, uh, welcome to use, or you can always go online, you can uh, use a credit card and give either through electronic check or your credit card, and for those of you watching live at home right now, that's for you as well. We want to continue the ministry that God has given us here in Cambria, and we're so grateful for your generosity to do that. Next week, we'll be starting a new series. I, I talked about habits today in this service. Um, I didn't go into great depth because I know that's what we're, going to, what we're going to do over the next six weeks. A very practical series that I'm putting together right now on what are some habits that we can form as Christians to help us grow closer in our walk and be wonderful examples of Jesus Christ. We'll start that next week and look forward to sharing that with you. Before you go, let me give you this good word. This is Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23-24. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you.